Well, um, as Ben and Caitlin announced, we are so close to the start of our uh, SALT Summer Intensive, which we're really excited about. In fact, there's only two days left to register. Two. Two days left to register. So I want to encourage you um, to get on that. We've had such a phenomenal response. People from all over the world, people from other countries, several different states throughout the U.S., people that are joining in and saying, I need to get the heart of God. I need to rise above political party. I need to rise above the narrative I'm hearing in the media. I need to rise above all the conflict and polarization, and I need to get the heart of God for how to respond and be salt today. And so um, I want to just mention this, because I know some of you have been asking this question. Um, how this online school works is you, when you sign up, you basically receive um, a couple of lectures a week that you get to listen to on your own time. So you work it in your own life. Um, you're given some other things as well, like, hey, this week, try to watch this documentary and read this article or whatever. And you get to do that all on your own time. So you get to work that in with what works best for you and your schedule. Um, there's only one time a week, Thursday evenings, um, where we all come together and have the opportunity to really process and talk and flesh out some of the things we're hearing and ask questions and, and get to be together live. And so um, that happens Thursday evenings. And if you live in another time zone where Thursday evening doesn't work for you, it's okay. We're recording that and you'll have access to that as well. So I wanted to kind of give you an idea of how this will work. Um, but we're going to be really diving into just the heart of God for peace building in this time and how we can, you know, really examine our own bias or look at our history or understand the different, you know, things happening in society and how do we get, how do we intelligently understand but then really press in for God's heart and how do we, what are the solutions and what does healing look like and how do we unite together and so we are so excited and even as uh, is different, you know, so many pieces have come together in this, we feel the heart of God so strongly in this and I'm telling you, this will be be deeply impactful for you. And so um, go to, to saltla.org uh, for that. Um, but we're going we're gonna to jump into the word this morning. <sighs> All week as I've just been pressing into the Lord and, and God, what are you saying to us? I, I feel so much. I, mean, I feel like I always feel such fear of God, but I feel so much fear of God. I feel so much just this place in his heart over his bride and um, I'm going to start in Matthew 24. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew 24. Little context, what's happening here is um, Jesus is talking with his disciples about what they can expect, what's to come uh, before he comes back. And so he offers a really rare and, and powerful glimpse really into here's what the enemy's end time plan is. And he's warning his children Here's the traps the enemy's going to try to lay for my kids. And he's laying it out. And when you read Matthew 24, it's very sobering, but also really helpful in understanding modern Christianity, understanding the times we live in and the times that are coming, right? And so I'm going to start in Matthew 24, verse 10. Jesus is speaking, and then he says, And then many will be offended start there, right? Wow, Jesus. And then many will be offended. It's like he's peeking into 2020. <laughs> They'll betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. We talked about this passage before. I, I, what I love about this is Jesus outlines that, you know, it's not just war and famine and hard, hard, hard until it just all falls apart. Jesus tells a different story. It's like, yes, these things will exist, but the gospel of the kingdom will be preached around the world. That is the end game, right? Love wins. The kingdom advances. The gospel of the kingdom takes root around the world, and then the end will come. Um, but I think what's really interesting that we need to look at in this passage 
is he's, Jesus is really highlighting these traps that the enemy is going to be laying for. Now listen, believers, Jesus in Matthew 24 is not talking to the lost. He's not talking about what we can expect the lost to be like. He's talking to disciples about the traps being laid for disciples, future disciples for future believers. He's talking about his house. This is really important. And so he's, he's giving a warning, right? And I, th I find it really helpful because I go, okay, Jesus warned the temptations, the traps that would be laid for his bride in, in, in our day. So let's, let's look at that. And, um, you know, it starts with many will be offended. Lawlessness, iniquity, sin, right? Lost focus from the teachings of Jesus, the gospel. And because people get off the narrow path, their love grows cold. He talks about false prophets, deception, breaking of relationship. But he ends with, but he who endures to the end. Church, we're called to endure in love to the end. There will be many temptations to allow our love to grow cold. And Jesus stood and said, it is vital, church, that your love endures to the end. He points out in this passage that the love of many will grow cold. The word Jesus is using here when he's talking about love is the word agape. That's a word that's reserved for Christians. That's not human love. That's, that's divine love. That's supernatural love. That's love that comes from the Holy Spirit. That's biblical love, sacrificial love, godly love. You know, how do you see this playing out? I think it's a good, a good moment um, to take some time when you read this passage and think, does it feel like maybe there's been some traps laid for me? It's easy to go, oh yeah, so many people are offended. It's different to look in our own hearts and say, are there traps the enemy has laid for me to be offended, for my love to grow cold, right? And so we look in. Um, do I feel some temptation to betray, to give up on, to talk bad about, to be suspicious, to break relationship with somebody? Do I feel temptation to become so angry and disgusted with certain people or groups that maybe I even hate them? Do I feel temptation to believe everything I hear or everything I want to hear? Right? Has somebody mentioned to me, maybe I'm believing some untruths. See, the thing with deception is the person who's deceived is usually the last person in the room to know they are. Um, have I stepped into the temptation of, of maybe justifying some behavior in my life because I see other Christians doing it? Or maybe I package it a certain way, like, oh, that's just righteous anger, or that's just whatever, and we package it a certain way, and we've kind of given ourselves an excuse to not be loving. How's our love level? Honestly, are, are we truly more in love with Jesus today than we were a year ago? Is our heart breaking with love for humanity more today than it was a year ago? Not just, maybe that's too general. Is my heart growing in love for annoying people, for hard people, for people that are different than me? Or is it becoming more and more of a chore to love them? Am I quick to judge or quick to believe the best? It's easy, I think, sometimes to, to believe the best in people that are like us. Am I quick to believe the best? Because that's what love is, right? Am I quick to believe the best in people that are really different than me, that see the world differently than me, that vote differently than me, that, that look differently than me? Am I quick to believe the best or do I tend to be suspicious? You know, when you look at this passage, it, it is, it's sobering. <laughs> it's kind of one of those, hey, let's look under the hood for a moment and see what's really going on here. And uh, I, I want to start, because today we're going to be talking about a love uprising. I am so stirred and compelled in my spirit that love is the answer. Love is the answer for everything happening in our society. That is not like some kind of hippie, theoretical, no, love is the answer. And... Um, I think we need to wake up as a church 
that there is a war planned from the beginning of time of the enemy. There is a war against your love. The thing that is being fought over is our love. Our love, the enemy is trying to get our love to grow cold. He's trying to get us offended. He's trying to get us deceived. Remember, even this deception piece, he's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking about believers becoming deceived, right? He's trying all the plays in the book to try to get our love to grow cold. Hell is on a mission to weaken our love. The enemy is terrified of love. He's terrified of it. Why? Why is the enemy so afraid of radical, selfless, agape love? I think it's a, it's a good time for us to be asking that when you really see it on the chopping block in society. You know, the reality is love isn't something we aim for or something we just do. It is the driving force of Christianity. Love is number one, two, three, four, five. Love is all of it, right? When you boil down all of Christianity, the entirety of the Bible, all of who God is, if you boiled it all down to one word, it is love. Love is who God is. Love is why he made us. It's why he put us on the earth. You know, love is why he gave his life for us. Love is the call. It's the mission. It's the solution. It's heaven's culture. It's the answer. It's the focus. Love is the end game. It's all about love. This whole thing is about love. In fact, Jesus told us in John 13, 34, he said, so I give you now a commandment. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you're my true followers. Love is what defines a Christian. Love is what makes us true followers. Love is the difference from the wide path to the narrow path. Love is everything in the kingdom. So this word love that Jesus is using is the word agape. And agape love is selfless love. It is not being concerned with self. It's not born out of emotions or feelings or, you know, history or attraction, familiarity, none of that. It's a choice. It's a choice of the will. Agape requires faithfulness, commitment, and sacrifice without expecting absolutely anything in return. This is the kind of love that the Bible speaks about the most. In fact, in the New Testament, um, there's over 200 references to agape love. Agape is a choice. It's a deliberate striving for somebody else's highest good. It's radical, it's generous, it's selfless love. And the only way you can access agape love is by connecting to God. It comes through the Holy Spirit. It's God's agape love flowing through us. Church, we are not going to be able to withstand the traps of the enemy in our day unless we get really, really committed to staying in communion and in connection with God. Because human love is not going to be enough. Human wisdom will fall short. It is through intimate connection to the Holy Spirit that we're going to be able to continue to not have our love grow cold, but grow more and more fiercely passionate in love with God and with people. You know, late in the life of the Apostle John, he wrote almost exclusively um, about agape love. And I'm sure, you know, when you kind of hear his teachings, most of his audience were like, we get it, we get it, you know, because he talks a lot about love. Um, but I, I wonder if maybe John, you know, remembered hearing these words from Jesus and decades later, you know, just constantly thinking, this is what the church needs to be reminded about. 1 John 3.11, this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love God one another. This is the message. Love. Love one another. 
1 John 3, 16 and 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. 1 John 4, 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he, does not love, for he who does not love his brother whom he's seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? Clearly, John saw the practice of, of godly love in the church as critical to those living in his day. How much more in our day, right? In 1 Corinthians 13, reminds us that if we speak in tongues but don't have agape love, we're nothing. I think we have a, a slide here. There we go. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. You see, love looks like something. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's own achievement uh, or inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, dang, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love's a safe place for shelter. It never stops believing the best in others. I love that. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. Love never stops loving. See, love looks like something. This is what's under attack. This kind of love that we, we hear about in Scripture, this is what the enemy is desperately trying to get to grow cold in our life. You know, we're reminded in the same passage that if we speak in tongues but don't have agape, we're nothing. Or if we prophesy mysteries but don't have agape, we're nothing. Or if we have faith and can do all these miracles but we don't have agape, we're nothing. Or we give everything to the poor but at the end of the day we don't have agape, we're nothing. Right? It's all pointless. It's empty without love. Why? 1 John 4, 8, because God is love. God is love. It's who he is. It's the very essence and nature of God in us. You know, I, I've been really thinking about and praying into why is the enemy hellbent on destroying love? The reality is love is the very essence of God in you. It's the very essence of God flowing through you to the world around you. If the enemy can get our love to grow cold, then he can disconnect you from your lifeline, and he can also stop somebody else from experiencing God through you. So it's mass casualty. If the enemy can, can get your love to grow cold, he cuts you off from your lifeline, from your God essence, and you no longer become a, a fountain, a source of life to people around you. Love is the life source. Love is the change agent. Love is where the power is. Love is where life is. The enemy is working overtime. I, I don't like to spend a lot of time talking about what the enemy is doing, but I think it's important that we really understand this because we see this happening. We see Jesus' warning literally unfolding in our day. The enemy is working overtime to offend people. To, to get people to walk away from relationship. To get people to, to betray each other. To be suspicious of each other. The enemy is working overtime because he is terrified of the power of agape love flowing through our lives. He's trying to get us to disconnect from our lifeline. It's evil. It's violence. It's destructive. And I think when we really realize what's happening and we get out of our own feelings and out of our own offense and we, we step back and we're we able to objectively really look at what's happening, 
it should make this thing rise up and it's like, oh, heck no. Uh-uh. I'm not about to be a pawn in what you're trying to do, right? I am, I am not about to participate in this because it's really easy when we're feeling hurt or, or offended or whatever to, to justify our actions. And, and something should rise up and say, I'm not, I will refuse to have any part in that in my life. See, the enemy is, is trying to get us offended or deceived or be okay with diminishing love in our heart for people. I think this just really should provoke a revolt inside of us. I think it should make us rise up in the face of all of, of the pain and the evil, right? And just kind of rise up with this, I refuse I'm starting, a, I'm starting a, a revolution. I'm starting an uprising. I'm starting a revolt. Because the reality is love is the greatest rebellion in the face of what the enemy is trying to do in our day. Love is saying, I refuse to engage in that. In fact, I'm going to love you even more wildly. I'm going to pursue you even more radically. You can't get rid of me, right? Love is, is the absolute rebellion to the, plan, the end time plan of the enemy. Love is the absolute rebellion to his plan because it's who God is. And I really believe the dividing line in history will be those who chose love. It's not a feeling, it's a choice, right? Those who chose love, the narrow road, the hard road, the many times lonely road of love, and those who allowed their love to grow cold. See, love is the great disruptor. It is the revolution. It is the rebellion against evil. It is the uprising that Jesus came to bring and calls us to carry on. It's our lifeline and it's our destiny. See, if God is a solution to the world, which I believe he is, then love is the solution to the world. If you believe God's the solution, then love is the solution because God is love. So love is the solution to broken politics. Love is the solution to broken marriages. Love is the solution to pain and suffering. Love is a solution to injustice. Love is the solution. Love is supreme. The reality is our love for God and our love for people has to be defended, has to be fought for. It's not gonna casually happen. You become a Christian and then, oh, I just feel all this love for God and people. And then you go outside for five minutes or you get on social media for five seconds. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm not sure I love them, right? That is the temptation of the enemy. That we have to fiercely defend love. You guys, this is our legacy. This is our inheritance. This is the family we belong to. We are a people of love. And our very legacy, our very inheritance is being warred over right now. So can we go back to 1 Corinthians 13? <clears throat> love is large incredibly patient. It's gentle, consistently kind, refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to somebody else. It doesn't brag about its own achievement, doesn't inflate its own importance. It doesn't traffic in shame and disrespect. It doesn't selfishly seek its own honor. It's not easily irritated. Agape is not easily irritated. It's not quick to take offense. Agape joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place for shelter and it never stops believing the best in others. I love that. I really believe the solution for 2020 and everything happening right now is love. I want to jump into Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. You know, this is a story where Jesus is, once again, talking about love. It's a story where he's fleshing this out like, okay, we get it. We're called to love. What does that look like? What does loving my neighbor actually look like? 
Break it down for me, Jesus. I agree with the theory. Help me to understand what this looks like in my day to day. And this is Jesus really breaking this down for his hearers, his disciples, of what this looks like in the day to day. Because love looks like something, right? And so what we read here, let's just pick up in verse 25. Just then, I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. Just then a religious scholar stood before Jesus in order to test his doctrines. He posed this question. Teacher, what requirement must I fulfill if I want to live forever in heaven? Jesus replied, what does Moses teach us? What do you read in the law? The religious scholar answered, it states, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your passion and all your energy and your every thought. And you must love your neighbor as well as you love yourself. And Jesus said, well, that's correct. Now go and do exactly that and you will live. Wanting to justify himself, he questioned Jesus further, saying, what do you mean by my neighbor? Jesus replied, listen, and I'll tell you. And he begins to tell this story. This whole story we're going to read is Jesus' response to what does loving other people supposed to look like? What is that supposed to look like? Now, remember, that's in the context of Jesus, I want to make it to heaven, right? Jesus, what are you looking for? Jesus, how do I really honor, honor you? Jesus, how do I have eternal life? And the answer is love God, love people, right? This is, this is what's happening here. What are you looking for? What requirements must, must I fulfill if I want to live forever in heaven? This is his response to this question. And so, you know, in response to who is my neighbor that I'm supposed to love like myself, what does love look like in my everyday Jesus tells this story. He says, There was once a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho where bandits robbed him along the way. They beat him severely, stripped him naked, and left him half dead. Soon, a Jewish priest walking down the same road came upon the wounded man. Seeing him from a distance, the priest crossed to the other side of the road and walked right past him, not turning to help him one bit. Later, a religious man, a Levite, came walking down the same road and likewise crossed to the other side to pass by the wounded man without stopping to help him. Finally, another man, a Samaritan, came upon the, uh, the bleeding man and was moved with tender compassion for him. He stooped down and gave him first aid, pouring olive oil on his wounds, disinfecting them with wine, and bandaging them to stop the bleeding. Lifting him up, he placed him on his own donkey and brought him to an inn. There he took from him his donkey and, and carried him to a room for the night. The next morning, he took his own money from his wallet and gave it to the innkeeper with these words, take care of him until I come back from my journey. If it costs more than this, I will repay you when I return. So... And then Jesus looks back up at the crowd, right? So now tell me, which one of the three men who saw the wounded man proved to be the true neighbor? The religious scholar responded, the one who demonstrated kindness and mercy. Jesus said, you must go and do the same as he. You must go and do the same as he. Whew, this story, I don't know about you, I, I've grown up in the church, I've read Bible stories my whole life, and I think sometimes I forget the impact of them when you've heard, they've become familiar, right? And Jesus is giving a radical answer to who's my neighbor. There's so much going on in this story. This isn't like, just be kind to your actual family, be kind to people who live around you. You need to understand the Samaritans and Jews were bitter enemies, bitter enemies. I mean, we're talking like, imagine rival gangs. Imagine, you know, two groups that hate each other, two groups that have very different religious and political beliefs. You know, there's a lot of animosity between these two groups. And Jesus just brings them right into the middle of his story because Jesus is awesome like that. Jesus just brings it right into the middle of his story. And, um, you know, it, it's, he's speaking to a, a Jewish crowd. This is the context. He's speaking to a Jewish crowd. And um, he makes the Samaritan really the hero of the story. He makes this, you know, he, he put, 
I mean, this is uncomfortable. This is uncomfortable for the Jewish crowd listening to, to this. The Jewish people in the, in the you know, story don't respond right, basically, and the Samaritan does. And uh, really, this story boils down to anybody in, in need is your neighbor, right? And will you stop and selflessly love people who are hurting? And he, you know, goes into go and do likewise. So I want to I want to quickly point out um, five things that I think are really important in this story for us when, when looking at what love looks like. Okay. Um, number one, love disrupts. Love is so disruptive. I don't know if you've noticed this yet. <laughs> um, love is deeply disruptive to our lives. Notice the ones everybody conspir- you know, considered spiritual didn't want to be disrupted. They didn't want to be inconvenienced. Um, Jesus tells a story that you know, everybody listening to feels really challenged. Why weren't they willing to be disrupted? They, I'm sure, had a million reasons, like we do, right? So you're walking into this situation, you see some pain, you see something happening in society, you see somebody saying, I'm in pain, I need help, and love has a choice. Am I going to continue to walk, or am I going to stop and engage, right? Now, some of the reasons maybe that they didn't want to be disrupted, some of the questions maybe they were wrestling with was, well, was it this guy's own fault? Did he steal from somebody and that's what happened? He got, you know, kind of what he had coming to him? Did he deserve it? Well, I don't know the full story here. Does this guy have a history of crime? Is he a bad guy? I mean, as a priest, as a believer, should I be stopping for a bad guy? What will other believers think about me if I stop and help? If I engage in this issue, if I reach out to help this person, if I help him, will people think that I agree with his lifestyle, his politics? Will they think I support his values? I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to condone his sin. I have so much going on. This is going to be really time-consuming to stop. This is going to be hard to engage. I don't have a lot of experience in helping people like this. There's probably somebody better to help him than I am. You know, I'm not really qualified to help. I probably should stay focused on my God mandate, my God projects, my priorities. I'm headed to the temple to do God things, right? What if I get attacked like he did? I mean, this is probably not wisdom to stop and help. I don't know what I'm getting myself into. What if these bandits are still here? I don't even know who this guy is. If I stop and help, I might be late to my appointment. I mean, I don't want to dishonor people. I don't want to be late to my appointments. I'll often just, you know, adjust my entire travel schedule. I might have some missed opportunities if I do this, if I engage in this. Besides, he's a bloody mess, right? I don't want to get his mess on me. What will people think of me if I intervene? Will they think I'm a liberal? Will they think I'm a conservative? That I'm distracted from my God assignment? That I'm not focused on the right thing? Will they think I have wrong motives? Will they blame me? Will they accuse me? Will they misjudge me? What if my helping turns into something bigger than I anticipated? What if this turns into more time and money and relationship than I actually really want to give? We can relate to this the priest and the Levite in this story. And the reality is Jesus lets everybody sit in their discomfort in this story. He's like, yeah, love is disruptive. Love will disrupt your comfort. Love will disrupt your wallet. Love will disrupt your reputation. Love will disrupt your time. Love is disruptive. It's a whole lot easier to keep walking, church, It's a whole lot easier to not engage in mess, not wade into pain and injustice. Trust me, that just keep walking and let somebody else deal with it mentality can be really tempting at times. Jesus' story highlights that love is uncomfortable. It forces us out of our comfort zone. It's costly. It's inconvenient. 
me tell you this, love will not make you popular. Love will not make you rich. Love will not make you famous. In fact, stopping to love and, and wade into pain and, and mess may empty your church faster than it will fill it. You loving people may take a whole, you know, may make a whole lot of other people uncomfortable. Maybe the priest was worried about the other members of his temple. What would they say? If they'd be offended, how they'd maybe misrepresent him or his intentions in stopping. If he engaged with this potential bad guy. Now remember to the Samaritans, the Jews were the bad guys. They were absolutely the bad guys to them. Maybe the Levite was worried that other believers would tell him to just, you know, stay out of it. The Levites were the worshipers, right? Go sing your song, stick to worship, stop engaging in this. Who knows? But I can tell you this, that following Jesus, loving God and loving people is not going to be easy or comfortable or convenient because love is deeply disruptive. It's costly. It's inconvenient. And you can expect to be misunderstood or misrepresented. Jesus just lets his hearers just sit in this. He lets them fill the reality of how disruptive love is. Number two, love is not only disruptive, but love risks. You know, I love that it says in this story that the Samaritan was moved with tender compassion for his enemy. He was moved with tender compassion, not for somebody like him, for somebody who was a part of a group who had insulted, spit on, rejected, I mean, hurt, abused, all the things. It says that tender compassion filled his heart for him. You know, in a lot of ways, this wasn't somebody who deserved to be stopped for. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's easier for me to be like, okay, well, I'll stop for that one. But I'm not going to stop for that one. And we start doing this in our head like as if somehow we get to pick who gets our love and who does, doesn't. And Jesus just addresses all that with this story, right? And so, you know, I, when I read this, his heart was moved with tender compassion. I, I want to ask you, like, ask your, I've been asking myself this. When was the last time my heart was moved with tender compassion for somebody that I don't like? Somebody that's different than me. Somebody that sees the world differently than me. Somebody that, that has a really different worldview or value system than me. Has my heart really been moved with tender compassion? Or is it just kind of at a, I tolerate them and say I love them, but really, if I dig into my heart, it's more of a, I tolerate at best. This man's heart was moved with tender compassion. Remember, this whole story is Jesus telling us, you know, um, all to show people what loving, he's telling the story to show us what loving your neighbor looks like. And he highlights compassion as an attribute of love. Compassion drives this man to make some pretty big risks. It's going to be hard to risk in love for people without compassion in our heart. Compassion will drive us. Compassion is what drove God, right? Think about all the risks God did for us. I mean, think about the context here. A man was just brutally assaulted and left for dead right there. Right on the same road he's on. This is a dangerous road. This is a dangerous, intense moment. Is he next? If he stops, will he also be assaulted? Will he be attacked? Is it wise to stop? What if he helps the guy and then the guy turns on him because it's his enemy, right? What if this is a trap? What if, what if? Our brains are so good at doing the what if. And many times, if we follow the what if trail, we'll end up doing no nothing versus if we lean into compassion, we'll take the risk. The reality is the safest thing for him to do in that moment was to get the heck out of there. But it's his heart of compassion that drives him to intervene. He risks his comfort, his peace. He risks a lot to intervene in this man's life. He doesn't wait for more information. He doesn't research the man's history or his voting record. 
He doesn't wait for DNA tests to find out what his race is. He doesn't ask him his religious affiliation. He doesn't ask for his bylaws and print out, you know, of his values before he decides to risk a lot to help him. He sees a man in pain, in need. He sees a man in danger. And because of the compassion in his heart, he takes huge risks to intervene. I think sometimes if we see in ourselves an unwillingness to take a risk, I think sometimes it's, it's more related to our compassion level than our fear level. And the, the solution to that is sitting with Jesus, right? You sit with Agape himself and you let him fill your heart. You let him begin to show you people from his perspective and it will compel you to do things you never thought you'd do. Are we willing to risk being misunderstood? Are we willing to risk getting other people's mess on us? Are we willing to risk not being liked? Are we willing to risk losing business? Are we willing to risk the American dream? Are we willing to risk our position of privilege and safety? Are we willing to risk our comfort? Are we willing to risk our control? Compassionate love will drive us to risk a lot. You know, look at, look at God. For God so loved the world that he became flesh. He stepped into all of our pain, our mess, our drama, our suffering. I mean, Jesus is the Samaritan in the story. He risked it all. He risked heartache, physical pain, rejection, being misunderstood by his own. He risked even a brutal death. But love and compassion compelled him to risk it all. Yes, it was risky, but it, it was undeniably worth it. You know, I am so, so proud of this church. I am so proud of this community. I am so grateful to be a part of a community that is willing to wade into hard things. Because I'm just, you know, just honestly, I think as maybe some are doing, it would be easier just to kind of brief mention of, of some of the things that are happening in our nation right now in regards to racial inequality and then just kind of sweep it under the rug and keep going and just act like it's not happening around us. I am so grateful for a community that's willing to wade in going, we realize this is challenging. We realize we don't have all the answers. We realize there's tensions to be held. We realize there's no easy answer here, but we're willing to get messy. We're willing to be misunderstood. We're willing to take some risks because we see the cry on the side of the road and we're not gonna walk by. We're not gonna keep walking. We're willing to take risks. We're willing to pay the cost. We're willing to not be liked. We're willing to, to have it be a little messy. It's okay but we're gonna err on the side of love and we're gonna go into this with the Holy Spirit and we're gonna figure this out and we're all gonna come out stronger because of it. I am so grateful for a community that's willing to do hard things, that's willing to do hard and holy work, that is willing to risk for love. I am so grateful. You know, there will always be critics and every one of us will have to decide if we fear man or if we fear God. I love the words of Martin Luther King Jr. He says, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. At the end of the day, this is, think about this. At the end of the day, it's likely that according to human standards, the priest and the Levite were celebrated. See, we're reading in a different context. But in this story, the priest and Levite were most likely celebrated. They were looked on as the good guys. They showed up on time to their meetings that day. They hadn't ruffled any feathers. They focused on and got a lot done in their temple duties. They were clean. They were wise with their money. They didn't engage in the drama happening around them. They were well-liked. But according to Jesus, they missed it. The priest and the Levite had all the favor of man. But according to Jesus' metrics, which are different than man's metrics, 
Without agape, you have nothing. The person that others most likely viewed as negative was the Samaritan. He was problematic. He had blood on him. He had lost money. He'd missed some meetings, let some people down. His, his donkey looked a mess, right? People seeing him walk through town with a half-dead man, man on his donkey probably got him some side eyes, some suspicion, some rumors. Oh, what are you doing? What, were you involved in this? People, I'm sure, were questioning his involvement. They didn't see what happened. They see a good Jewish man, bloody on this man's donkey, this enemy of theirs. I mean, can you imagine the rumors in town? We don't think about this part of the story. And Jesus says, well, which one do you think I say loved their neighbor, right? And they answer, the one who showed compassion on him. God's metrics of success are not like ours. Making people happy and making God happy are two very different things. Church, listen. And the latter, making God happy may very well cost you the former, making people happy. Because love requires risk. Number three, love invests. So not only is this Samaritan willing to be disrupted and willing to risk, but he invests. He intervenes. He invests his time, his energy, right? His resources, his skills, his relationships. He gives the man medical aid. He treats his wounds. He exerts a lot of time and energy, lifts him up on his donkey. I don't know what kind of donkeys they had back then. They probably came like the donkeys do today, and they're not double-seaters, right? So that means this man is on his donkey. This guy probably finally, you know, was able to afford a good whip. You guys like that? Whip? My kids say that's really embarrassing. I should not say that. Okay. He finally affords his donkey, and he can't even, he's walk. he's given his place of comfort and privilege. He's, he's given it to this enemy of his. And this man is now walking on a road he has every right to be riding his donkey on, right? He's investing. Great investment. Um, he's investing in somebody who's been a part of a group who bullies him and rejects him and mocks him. There were very different people, different, different uh, you know, very different political ends of the spectrum. And this man is investing in him. You know, remember, Jesus is talking to Jewish people. <laughs> and he's saying the people who should have stopped didn't. And the one who everybody would expect not to stop did. And you know, I find this, I, I've talked about this a lot, but I find this so often in our culture. Where Christians haven't shown up in politics, or we haven't shown up with race issues, or we haven't shown up in education, or we haven't shown up in these things, and then we want to criticize those who did, right? We want to tell them how they're all doing it wrong, and it's like, what in the world? How about we show up? We show up. We honor those who are trying their best without God, right? Or measures of God, trying their best to bring solutions. This isn't about telling people what they're doing wrong. This is about coming from a place of love and saying, I'm willing to invest alongside of you. We don't have to agree. We don't have to, you know, see everything eye to eye, but I'm willing to invest because of love. Love looks like investment. Looks like putting your money and your time and your energy where your mouth is, right? Um, love is not a feeling, it's action. Love doesn't look, hey, what can I get out of this, right? It invests with no expectation for return. Love invests in a way that if it were Jesus himself on the side of the road bleeding, how you'd stop. How would we respond if Jesus was bleeding and hurting and crying out for help on the side of the road? That's how love responds. Agape responds as though it's Christ, whether you agree with the person or not, right? Love is not selective. It is not exclusive. It is not limited. Agape invests 
regardless if people deserve it or not. Now we're gonna do the last two really quick. Number four, love takes ownership. Here's the reality. The Samaritan man did not have to engage. He didn't have to make this his issue. We all know this man probably had plenty of issues to focus on himself, right? He was not in charge of road security. He wasn't on the committee, you know, the committee for, for road safety. This was not his issue. He was not in charge of this. He was not, you know, in any way, this was not his responsibility. He had zero responsibility for what happened. He wasn't to blame. He didn't make the mess. He didn't do it. Why should he clean it? Right? But he took ownership anyway. He hadn't caused the problem or the pain, but he was going to work to, to, work to fix it. Love doesn't say, you know, I had nothing to do with this, so don't ask me to clean this mess. Church, love doesn't say, I didn't make the mess. I don't have to clean it. Love says, I see somebody in pain. How can I help? Agape love is also not riding in on the horse like the big savior of the moment, like the hero. Because agape isn't about, you know, how I can make myself feel better about myself or make myself the hero of the story. Agape is about seeing people and being compassionate for them and coming underneath them and lifting them up and, and serving them. Agape love is selfless. It's not human love. Love takes ownership of problems we did not create, messes we didn't make. Love steps in and says, put it on my tab. Love steps into the pain in society and says, put it on my tab. Love steps into the middle of racism and says, put it on my tab. I'm going to work to make this right. I didn't create this mess. I'm going to work to make it right because agape flows through my veins because my God is alive in me and I have a God who has solutions and healing and I'm willing to be disrupted and I'm willing to invest. I'm willing to own this. I know I didn't make the mess, but I I'm gonna pull heaven to earth to see healing. I'm gonna pull heaven to earth to see solutions. I'll pick up the pieces. I'll take the criticism. I'll stick my neck out. I'll commit to a solution. Love takes ownership. And number five, Love follows through. Verse 35 says, The next morning he took his own money from his wallet and gave it to the innkeeper with these words. Take care of him until I come back from my journey. If it costs more than this, I will repay you when I return. This is powerful. He's not only going to take care of him when he's unconscious and not mouthy, right? He's willing to pay for his full recovery. What if this man wakes up and remembers how much he hates Samaritans? What if this man wakes up and insults him and curses him, right? Or makes, sues him for trying to help. The Samaritan man was committed to paying the cost no matter what. And he's saying, I'll, I'll return. I will follow this thing all the way through. Church, biblical love takes maturity. It walks with people for the long haul. It doesn't run when it gets hard or uncomfortable. I feel like there's such a, an ease to divorce in our world. It, the second things are hard, we're, we're quick to just exit. We exit our church, exit those relationships, exit our family, exit that covenant. We're quick to do that. And that is not biblical love. That is not mature love. Mature love follows it all the way through. Mature love keeps believing the best. Mature love fights for relationship. Mature love doesn't let offense get in the way. Mature love is willing to have the hard conversations. Mature love is willing to, to sit with each other and, and hear each other's heart. Mature love follows it all the way through. Love is not afraid of the process, even if it's messy or long. Love isn't looking for a cool hashtag or, you know, a social media moment. It doesn't just show up when it's trendy or cool. Love has endurance. It's willing to unravel the injustice piece by piece. It's willing to help nurture people back to life. It's willing to, to you know, care for the man and then go back to the road and, and develop the road safety committee or whatever's needed, right? Love walks the whole journey with people. Love is a marathon. It's not a sprint. 
It's not a moment. It's a culture. It's your lifestyle. And it takes great character to have agape love. Great integrity. It's, it's keep, you know, continuing to do the right thing when nobody's watching or when everybody else is bending the rules. Or when all the other Christians have crossed the other side of the road. It's keep stopping, even if you're the only one. It's to continue to love people when we don't feel like it, right? When it's annoying, when we're tired, when we don't want to love people. Mature love, agape love, keeps showing up, which is why, family, we have to connect to who God is. We can't do this in our own strength. Our love runs out. We have to keep connecting into the vine, connect into who he is. I'm so thankful for God's mature agape love in my life, that he doesn't give up on me when I get annoyed, that he doesn't give up on me when I'm complicated, when I, whatever. He doesn't. He keeps pressing in. And this is the invitation that we get to bring to the world. We get to model to the world God's love that doesn't give up. God's love that follows through. I want to encourage you these, these five things. Think about them this week. Am I willing to be disrupted for love? Am I willing to risk? Am I willing to invest? Am I willing to take ownership? Am I willing to follow through and, and just sit with the Lord in this and ha- ask him to grow love in you? I believe it's time for an uprising. I feel this like call of a revolution stirring in my bones. We need to shake off the assault of hell against our birthright, against our position of authority, our legacy. We are children of a God of love, made in his image, carriers of his love to a broken and hurting world. They will know that we are followers by our love. We've got to refuse with every ounce of our being offense. Refuse to just believe whatever you hear or whatever you want to believe, right? We've got to get in the word. We've got to listen to each other. We've got to humble ourselves. We've got to refuse the temptation that it's just too hard or too complicated or I should just mind my own, my own business or even, you know, worse, telling other people that they're out of line because they're stopping in love. I wholeheartedly believe that right now, at this moment in history, the ingredients are on the table for a global move of God, a global tidal wave of love and revival and restoration. I believe the ingredients are in society right now. I don't have time to go into all of that, but hear my heart in this. There is a love awakening that heaven is crying out for and earth is crying out for. And you and I are dropped right into the middle of it. I'm telling you, the move of God, the kingdom of God at hand is a, is a move of love. It is a move of love. And there is an all-out war against our love. And I want to call us to rise up together and say, not on my watch. Not on my watch. We are people of love, and I refuse I refuse to be one who will be pulled into offense, to be one who will be pulled into, you know, to... to um, being deceived. I will refuse to betray and walk away from a relationship. I'm going to fight for love. I'm going to allow myself to be disrupted. I'm going to keep taking risks. I'm going to keep investing even when it's hard and it's costly. I'm going to keep taking ownership of my church, of my community, of what's going on around me. I'm going to, I'm going to keep following through. I'm not going to walk away because it's easier or because I see other people doing it. It is time to rise up and see heaven crash in because of radical love. Amen. I'm going to pray for us as we close. Will you, even if you're at home, just stand with me during your room, wherever you are. Will you just stand up? I want us just to, if you're watching with somebody, grab their hand. Listen, if you were here, I'd be making you hold everybody's hand in here because we need to do this together, family. We need each other in this. Grab somebody's hand, stand up, engage your spirit. We're going to pray. Jesus, we are so grateful that you came with agape love. We are so grateful that your love found us. We're so grateful that your love didn't give up on us. We're so grateful that your love keeps investing in us. Father, I pray for a love 
awakening to happen, God, for an uprising of love to come out of your people. I pray for radical, fierce love to rise up and burn in our bones, God. That we would hunger love more than we desire to be right, God. That we would hunger love more than we desire, God, to be heard. Lord, I pray for this kind of radical agape love, Lord, that you spoke about to rise up in your people. I pray like we would be, God, that we'd be like John, just constantly reminding ourselves of the need for love. That love is number one, two, three, four, five, six. Love is all of it. God, I pray, Lord, that you would search us in anywhere, God, that we have given in to the traps, God, spoken of in Matthew 24, anywhere, Lord, in our lives where we've fallen into the temptation, God, of offense or, or being suspicious of other people, God, or, or not giving them the benefit of the doubt, Lord, anywhere that's happened in us, God, I pray we repent. We ask that you would rid it out of us, Lord. We don't want anything to do with what the enemy is doing in our day. God, I pray that the hurting, God, that those in our lifetime, God, those in our generation, Lord, that are crying out from the side of the road saying, will you see me? Will you stop for me? I'm bleeding. I'm hurting. I need help. Even if their life scares us or their lifestyle scares us or whatever they're doing, God, is repulsive to us. Lord, I pray for a disruptive love to take us over. God, we want to see your house full. We want to see people encountered. God, we want to see people transformed by your love. And God, it's going to flow through us. So God, I pray first in us a love uprising. I pray for a revolution of love to happen inside our hearts, our minds, our opinions. Lord, let love take the highest place. Let love be supreme so that it could flow out of us and that this world could see you and know you and be encountered by you, God. I pray, Lord, that Christians would be known in this move that is at hand. Christians, true Christians, true believers would be known by love. That they would, God, that the world would cry out and say, truly God is a God of love because I met people from Expression 58. Truly God is a God of love because somebody found me in my pain and loved me. Somebody listened and waded into my mess with me. Truly there is a God of love. God, I pray, I pray, Lord, that we would rally around this banner of love. That nothing else, Lord, nothing else would separate your people, God. That we would rally around a banner of love. I thank you, God, that we don't have to all think the same or look the same or vote the same, God, but we rally around you, the God of love. Father, I pray for everyone, every home. I pray, Lord, for just as though like a baptism of love in our lives, God. Reset our, our compass back to true north, Lord, in our lives. Heal broken relationships. Heal any place, Lord, where there's just been division. Lord, I pray for love to overwhelm us and overtake us and to flow out of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, expression. We love you. Have an amazing week.